where to in 2022? What should we focus on? What should we pay attention to? There's so much going on. Where do we even begin? So this is the focus of this masterclass hosted by the Permaculture Education Institute. I'm Maura Gamble. I'm the founder of the Institute and also the creator of the Permaculture Educators Program, which is a global learning community for permaculture teachers on six continents. I'm so glad to have your company here today. I know that there's people joining in from around the world here. So I welcome you here warmly and also welcome you if you're here listening as a recording. So each month I produce one of these free classes exploring the thinking and practice of permaculture. In order to respond to today's question, where to in 2022, I decided to share with you snippets from a number of conversations I've been having on my podcast, The Sense Making in a Changing World, with leading ecological thinkers and activists. There's some extraordinary people I get the pleasure and honor of speaking to each week. And much of what you're hearing here in this session has not been released yet as a podcast. So you're the first to hear these conversations. I'd like to acknowledge, of course, that there are many voices that are not in the room and that this is a snapshot. In my films, my blog, courses and podcasts, I try to link as widely as possible and to be an active node in this movement of movements. And I encourage you to do that too and to dive into the diversity and richness and to connect as broadly as possible. I hope you enjoy this session and find inspiration. I invite you to listen deeply with your heart open and feel free to share your reflections in the chat. I'd like to acknowledge too that I'm seated here on the traditional lands of the Gubbi Gubbi people, the unceded lands of the Gubbi Gubbi people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to invite you to uh, put in the chat your name, where you're from, and also if you know the traditional custodians of the land on which you're seated here with us today. just wanted to quickly let you know too that I did say that this was going to be a 60-minute session, but it is in actual fact going to be a 90-minute session. So um, sit back and enjoy. Throughout this session, I'll introduce you to a number of different people I've been having wonderful conversations with. Uh, so the first person I'd like to introduce you to is Satish Kumar. Satish Kumar is the founder of Schumacher College in England. He's also been the editor of Resurgence magazine uh, for decades. He is a leading voice in the ecological movement. I first met Satish when I was in my early 20s, and it was actually some of the things that I remember him talking about back then that inspired me to be the activist that I am today. So I'd like to open this session with a short section of the conversations with Satish Kumar. Welcome to the show, Satish. It's an absolute delight to see you again and to, to have you here in conversation. One of the biggest questions that I wanted to ask you, I think we'll just start with the big question, is I know that your work has always been focused on looking at creating the small and slow solutions. Um, you, you created Schumacher College, which is based on Small is Beautiful, the work of Schumacher. Yet today, we have such urgent, massive problems. How do you, how can you describe and, and explain the ways that we can continue to ground ourselves in these small and slow solutions in the face of the urgency and the global crises that we're faced with? Thank you, Morag. That is a very wonderful question. But please remember that a great river is made of hundreds and hundreds of small tributaries. Without small tributaries, a great river cannot emerge. Even a great river itself starts somewhere in the fringe, somewhere in the hills, like a little spring, small spring. Then another spring, another tributary comes and joins. Then another tributary comes and joins. Another tributary. Hundreds of little, little tributaries make the great river. So, and all those tributaries are very slow. They flow, they are small, and they are flow. So nature is our teacher. We have to learn from nature and say how a great movement for transformation, a great movement for change to, to respond to the urgent and, and very pressing questions and problems of our time. 
they big questions will be solved by many 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 small actions so do not underestimate the value of work you are doing the value of work shumaka college is doing the value of work vandana shiva is doing the value of work fresh uh, of kapra is doing all these small small individuals making this great movement of transformation and change when you have an urgent problem at that time you need extra patience mm -hmm. when there urgent problem urgency and patience have to be paradoxically go together at this moment we have a climate change biodiversity diminishing our oceans are polluted our rivers are polluted our soil is polluted and our, we have a air polluted big big problems and social injustice spiritual discontentment all these big problems can only be solved by coming home and being resolute and resilient and continue to do our work with faith with commitment with dedication with resolve but without giving up but do not try to think that we have to be big ourselves the movement is big the global environmental movement is big and resurgence is one tributary shimaka college is one tributary friends of the earth is one tributary permaculture movement is one tributary the organic movement is one tributary this is how we create a regenerative culture so do not underestimate the value of your own work uh, murad small and slow has great power and do not underestimate the power of the slow and small with all of the people that you speak to all of the time and all of your reflections on this what do you feel is that key message today that we need to be speaking up about sharing talking together about walking and and thinking about what is it what is it that we need to what is that core message the two core messages number 1 which is my book called elegant simplicity we have to live a beautiful but simple life at the moment our lifestyle is so wasteful so much based on consumerism that we never know the end of our consumerism and the consumption and production and economic growth has become the end goal of life and everything else has become the means the nature has become a means to the end of economic growth nature is seen as a resource for the economy so that has to change we have to say nature is not just a resource for the economy nature is a source of life itself mm -hmm. and production consumption and and economic growth and and all money all that should be the means to an end and the end goal is integrity of our planet earth the integrity of nature the integrity of, of the ecosystem the second solution is that we all need to go back and touch the earth everybody who eats must participate in growing food a small garden even if you are not working uh, every day in the garden a few hours every day or even one or two days a week but being in touch with the soil if you eat you have no right to eat unless you grow some food how why somebody else should grow our food and we just eat and we pay them peanuts cheap labor always we say we have a cheap food and mass produced food to somewhere some big farmers i would say farm should be small and and gardens and everybody every house should be equipped with garden no house if you have no kitchen in the house is not a proper house there is no bedroom in the house is not a proper house in the same way there is no garden in the house is not a proper house every house must have a garden even in big cities like sydney or 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 melbourne or new york or london or paris or beijing or mumbai wherever you are even in big cities you should have a garden on your roof or garden on your balcony everybody must participate in the little bit of growing food even if you are a prime minister even if you are president even if you are ceo of a corporation even if you are a great professor even if you are a queen or a king so prime ministers presidents ceos everybody whoever you are must touch the earth 
If you have time to eat, you must have time to garden. In exploring where to in 2022, I'd like to share with you one of the leading voices that I see here in Australia, Dr. Anne Polina. Anne is an Indigenous woman from Madwara Fitzroy River area in northwestern Australia. She's a highly respected academic and a scholar activist. She's the leader of an organisation that I belong to as well called Regenerative Songlines Australia, which is part of a global movement for looking at ways forward towards regenerative society. This group in Australia is an Indigenous-led network of people working together towards regeneration by regionally. Anne and I have yet to record our podcast, but I wanted to include her voice here. She's one of the leading voices in regeneration and reconciliation here in Australia. So some of the quotes that I've drawn from her work are, are these. She speaks about how the land is alive, the rivers are alive, the living systems, all living systems are alive, and the birds and the fish, everything communicates, and that we are in relationship with this. And so in order to be regenerative, we need to connect, we need to connect deeply. And Anne says, this is why we're trying to encourage our fellow Australians, our brothers and sisters out there, to get to know where you live, because it's place-based. Regeneration, she says, is place-based, about being deeply connected to country. Dr. Polina carries on to say, don't see yourself as a human being as elitist and above other living systems. This is the gift of Indigenous people across the world, saying that we want you because your DNA is embedded here. And this is an important and healing statement. What she's saying is that you belong. And she calls for us to get to know our country, to feel our country, to heal our country, because it's all our country. And this task of regeneration is only something that we can do together. Next up is my dear friend, Joe Brewer, a brilliant and gifted thinker and deeply caring being committed to experimenting and living into regenerative cultures, creating culture design labs and is totally hands-on in, in doing this himself. He's also the author of The Design Pathway for Regenerative Earth. And this is his response to my question about becoming Indigenous to the planet. And so this ability to be Indigenous without being from Indigenous is a paradox. It's not supposed to make sense as a logic. The way it makes sense is as a way of learning how to relate. The process of relating. And that's exactly what all humans need to do that are going to contribute to the future of life on earth, is we need to rediscover gratitude for water, and gratitude for soil, and kinship with the rest of life. And our role, our unique role as humans, to dream with the rest of nature. And to dream on behalf of the rest of nature when it's necessary, when nature needs the rest of when nature needs her humans, we do the dreaming. And when I say something like this, one of the things that will activate in a lot of people, psychological block is, but humans have done all these terrible things. And I hurt so much for all these things. It's like, yes, that's exactly what we have to heal if we're gonna be grown up as a species because our ability to dream, our ability to imagine worlds, and like theater, to play them out. For me to be Macbeth and play the role. For me to be the humble forest man who brings a forest back. I'm playing a role. There's no other animal on earth that does that the way that humans do. And humans are shapeshifters. We can dream into different roles. I can try to imagine the river and I can try to imagine the bird and I can try to imagine the bee, and then I can make something that's good for it, for each of them. And no other animal can do that. So this way of being indigenous for me is that almost all of hunter-gatherer history was during the last ice age or before. The blip of time that was civilizations was the Holocene. The Holocene is now over. For those who don't know, I'm talking about this. 10,000 year period of warm, stable climate after the last ice age, it's over, it's done. 
the future is unprecedented, it's uncharted territory. So if we're going to be indigenous, we will not be indigenous like the people of the past. We have to be planetary indigenous, but that means we have to be bioregional indigenous and planetary, our survival depends upon it. We have to think at a planetary scale. Become planetarians. Yeah, thank you, Peter Berg, for that lovely word. Back closer to home in Nipaluna, Hobart, Tasmania, is permaculture activist, designer, educator, author, and TV star, Hannah Maloney. Hannah has joined me recently in the podcast after she released her book, The Good Life, How to Grow a Better World. And she also joined the Perma Youth to talk with them about ways to think about how to be in the world positively. Her work in permaculture is climate activism activism for social justice, activism for the forest, activism for soil, for community. And like me, her permaculture work began as an environmental activist. And similarly, we started feeling burnout, which is why we came to permaculture as a way of imagining what the world could be. So I talk with Hannah about her pivot to permaculture and also how she's deeply embedded activism in her permaculture work. In terms of our conversation here today about where to in 2022, why I'm sharing this conversation with you is because it's what we do in our everyday, which matters, and how our everyday permaculture life can be climate activism, can be us speaking up in the world for positive change. How do we do this forever? Um, And that's where I really pivoted and turned to permaculture because it's quite a holistic design framework which can nourish yourself and nourish the broader world. And so that's what I've really latched on to to keep me going as an activist um, in how to create a climate just and safe world. So that's my motivation. And the book very much does step people through how you can do that in the practical sense from a day-to-day on a small scale in your home or community scale. But it really sits in a broader framework of how actually we need to um, flex our muscles, our activist muscles, to put the pressure on politics, media and industry to do some drastically swift transition, make sure it's just just transition as well towards a climate safe future. So, um, yes, we should all compost, but it will not be enough if you don't vote for climate safe policies and demand, um, you know, safe practices by, by big industry towards climate safety. So, we have to embrace both that individual and collective, which really is the same thing. So we have to, we have to drop the ideas that, okay, I'm just going to look after myself in my own patch, my own garden, my own farm. Um, and we have to also drop the other side of the stories, which is don't bother doing anything at home. We've just got to be locking on into the forest or the machines, which is fantastic. We actually need to do both of those things and more. Yeah. <laughs> So So what is that? What is that more? Because if we're thinking about, so we've got to this point with permaculture and we're, you know, we've got our house in order. Ah, yeah. What is that? What is that more? What Mm -hmm. what are those things that you're advocating that we we flex our muscles and do more of? Yes, I think it it will be different for everybody. And there's a couple of things to acknowledge where the more privilege you have, the more capacity you have to do more things. Um, there's a lot of people in the world who don't have the privilege to work towards climate safety and that is, they're just trying to keep a roof over their heads and, you know, food on the table. Fantastic. They need to keep focusing on that. And people like myself and others who have more capacity, more privilege, can carry those people through, a, through to a climate safe future. So when I think about doing more, I think about how can I create, help create a good life for everybody, not just myself. We personally have a very good life. It's very abundant. It's very beautiful. Uh, we have secu- housing security. We have meaningful livelihoods. We are so privileged. <laughs> mm-hmm. How can I flex my muscles to carry more people with me beyond my own personal family and friendship circles? So that's what I think about. And that's why I think about um, politics a lot. I think about community structures that can help build resilience uh, locally and beyond. Um, if we've got that capacity, why wouldn't we have a crack at doing more? So when you talk about politics, What does that mean to you? I am very focused. Like in Australia, we have a federal election coming up within the year. So I am very focused on um, advocating for climate safe policies. So that's a short term um, focus for me because that's an opportunity that's presenting itself. 
Uh, but beyond that, politics is everything. What you eat is political. You know, how you, how you transport yourself is political. How you invest your money is political. <laughs> mm. I, I think people sometimes go, Hannah, you've got to keep the politics out of permaculture. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, and, and I'm so glad you said that because yeah. it's exactly right, isn't it? You know, we sometimes have this this separate thing, but it, politics is all about the choices and decisions that yeah. we make and how we organise ourselves and how we're in relation to one another and the land and, and our food system and it's, mm. it's all of that. And I think yeah. there's a cultural, dis, a cultural disconnect in Australia. I think this is a bit of a blanket statement, but I think there is a disconnect going, I don't do politics, it's over there. It's not for me. It's for that a certain type of person. I'm not that type of person. Um, when I really think there's a huge opportunity to reclaim our democracy, reclaim that politics, go, actually, we want our country to look like this and we want these people to represent us and to remember that they are working for us. <laughs> yeah. We're not, we don't have to just follow what they say. They go, no, no. We can explain to them clearly and intelligently and compassionately this is how we want our world to be and you and lovingly demand that. Um, we don't have to just sit and take what's happening right now. It is completely irresponsible use of power which is happening um, and it makes me furious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of these practical things we talk about for community resilience, which is food production, um, building community relationships and catching water, all those practical things, they're actually really quick to set up. Mm. And we saw that a little bit with the beginning of COVID, that things happen really quickly yeah. when you want them to or when you need them to. And um, we used to run, help run the Hobart City Farm down here, which is now closed. But someone asked me the other day, he's like, why, why are you running a city farm again, Hannah? We, we need it now. And I just said, I just said to them, we could, we could set one of those up within a month. We would have it yeah. growing vegetables and within three months it'd be, it'd be, um, you'd be harvesting from it. Um, and I've, I've, I've kind of go, I've gone to a space where those things can happen when people will really get behind and support them rather than only doing them um, when people, some people are loving it and not getting the support you need to make it flourish. Yeah. So I've got this, I've got a lot of tools in the back of my brain. Like these things will happen when we, when we, the need is there and then they're going to pump in the best way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting category, categorization of how I, how do I spend my energy now to get. It's kind of like triaging, isn't it? It's kind yeah. of like you look at, well, I've, I've got this much energy. Yeah. And this is, this is where the, the most value it's like you were saying before, that principle of like what can you put in to get the, the most impact? And yeah. I think it's a really important thing to constantly ask ourselves, you know, when we are focusing on, on this kind of work is to think, you know, have that reflective time think is, is what I'm doing the most effective use of my time mm. when that bigger picture of, you know, creating climate safe future is, is kind of the goal. We can become very busy. Oh, um, yeah. You know, it's so easy to busy ourselves with a whole lot of stuff. We were talking about this just before we pressed record and, you know, there's so many great things to say yes to all the time, but where, you know, and how you decide that is is, is really challenging sometimes, but mm. I think it's it's important to, to stay in that reflective space and, and also to know, like you just said then, that you can, you know, you've done it, you've seen that it can work mm. and it's really, yeah, it needs that sort of momentum to make it happen and how is it that we can, you know, make yeah. a contribution to that and... Uh, yeah. I think someone once said to me, he's like, you know, a life of activism, you have to be get comfortable with being uncomfortable um, because you're constantly trying to push your, outside your comfort zone, stretching yourself and flexing those activist muscles as much as you can um, and constantly trying to do more within your capacity. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's still hard for me to um, be comfortable with that all the time. Like I'm, I'm naturally more of an introvert and I, I'm, push myself to do more and more public things because I can see it could be useful, mm -hmm. um, but it's not a natural skill. But I have remember hearing Bob Brown speak many years ago how he was naturally, this is my own words, but he um, is implying how he was also quite an introvert as a young person and he just practised, 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 practised so he could uh, hold that public space so beautifully and courageously as he did for many decades and still does today. Um, so people like that are a real inspiration to me. I'm like, oh, you can just practice this stuff. <laughs> no. I know there's something else that I'd heard you speak about before that's there's not it's there's a whole completely different issue, but it's around rent and it's about paying the rent. And that's something that oh, I've heard yeah. you speak a lot. Do you want to just 
chat a bit about that maybe. Sure, sure. So, so it's about how do we uh, acknowledge and centre First Nations people and communities in um, acknowledging that we are living on their unceded land uh, across all parts of Australia. And that we can, I talk about this a lot in my work, making sure that, that there's really good acknowledgement there, especially in permaculture, it's important. We stand on the very broad shoulders of First Nations cultures across the world. Uh, paying the rent is one really uh, tangible way we can, uh, I guess, put your money where your mouth is. So I do a monthly donation to the local Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre um, down the road from us. And that's just an ongoing, no obligation donation going, look, I acknowledge I live here on your unceded land. Here's some money that you can determine what you do with it, um, do what you will with it. And they run fantastic programs in a range of um, different areas for the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. It's a way of just um, giving back some self-determination when so much has been taken away from them, so much. Mm. It's just devastating to really think and feel into that. So we try to do things in every angle. That's like one of the easier things I can do. I'm like, why wouldn't I do that? <laughs> um, and the, some of the harder, more complex things I do is that ongoing edu self-education about um, racism, um, colonisation, uh, white supremacy, uh, what, what that means, uh, what's that meant for the past 200 years, what that means now and how I, you know, uh, not willingly, but help perpetuate that in the society that we live in and how can I help unravel that? And so self-education is, 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 again, it's a it's an uncomfortable thing because you have to go, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, sorry, I swore. <laughs> it's, it's not an easy pleasurable walk in the path uh, park um, how do you how do you yeah. educate yourself on that yeah I guess it's a lot of reading a lot of listening so many podcasts now mm. so um people go oh where should I look I'm like I feel like I see it in every direction I look like so many books and um, podcasts and radio interviews and um, essays are out everywhere like I, I don't feel like that's an excuse. I think you no, just it's happened. just opening up, <laughs> opening up your mindscape yeah. to see it. Yeah, it's everywhere. Um, and so, and a lot of First Nations voices in Australia and across the world are incredibly generous with providing really coherent resources for white people, <laughs> which is so <laughs> kind of them, um, yeah. and really breaking it down very simply. So, I, I just read. There's nothing, nothing in particular I would point people to, but like there's so much to explore and just to acknowledge, you know, the, the three permaculture ethics that we we work from are earth care, people care and fair share. And I really come back to that people care ethic. If, if we're real, if we really want to be authentic people working towards good change, let's start centering the people who are suffering the most. Mm -hmm. um, and First Nation communities are very much part of that, that, that pool of people um, we lose nothing and we gain everything when we do this. Like people, sometimes people are like, oh, it's too hard, uh, it's too confronting, I don't like this. And it's like, this is a good positive thing. Um, positive things aren't always easy, but they are always better. Yeah. During COP26, the Global Climate Conference in Glasgow last year, I zoomed in to talk with a number of friends who were there. Rob Hopkins is one of those um, talking with me from Glasgow. And he's a permaculture teacher who founded the Global Transition Movement and is also another incredibly clear thinker and one of the most humble and gentle people I know committed to the task of bringing forward positive change. So in this clip of our conversation, I asked him about how to elevate the voice of permaculture. I know we have so much to offer in the conversation of regeneration and repair of this planet. How, how can we be better heard? And also, what are his perspectives on the kind of activism needed, having seen what's going on on the streets of, of COP and also being involved deeply in climate activism and the transition movement for decades? You said something yeah. just a moment ago about that really what we need to be doing is to be being part of this movement of movements more and to be far more effective in what we're doing. Any tips on how, you know, something like the permaculture movement can step up into that space far more and not be so underground well i think i think a lot of it is about so my friend ruth bentovin and lucy neal they they run an amazing training called the art of invitation which i did a couple of years ago they're kind of community arts practitioners and one of the things that i remember they said that really impressed me was if you're putting on an event you're putting on a big event you know normally my my 
traditional practice as an activist would be right in the book the space and make a nice poster and put it up and, and then people are going to come and we're going to do something they were like no 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 actually 40 percent of the time and the resource needs to go into the invitation into inviting people to go and just making a poster is not enough and even when you make a poster you need to think about what are the fonts that I'm using? Like, like who, who are the people I want to be here? And what fonts are going to make them more likely to come? What imagery is going to make them more likely to come? Because chances are, a lot of the kind of imagery as permaculturists we might stick on a poster turns a lot, turn a lot of people cold, really. Oh, a rainbow and a serpent. Oh, like, knock yourself out. Hey, that's not really my kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? So, so it's, it's like, how do we... Um, uh, so, so yeah, they said you put forty percent of the time in the invitation, which includes going to people and saying we'd really like you to come, and using what in transition we call the power to convene. You know, there is a there is a, a power that we have to get particular people in the room for a conversation. So you put the time and the effort into that. Then the meeting itself is just twenty percent, mm -hmm. and then the forty percent then afterwards is making sense of what happened and then interpreting that and feeding it back to everybody who came. So I feel like we, we need to be really consciously every event that we do thinking, who do we need to be here? How are we building allyship with those people? How are we asking them to come in a, in a non-extractive way? How possibly are we able to kind of remunerate people for their time if they are, you know, young activists coming from, from very marginalized communities? How do we get them into the space and, and support them to be there? Um, and yeah, and I think it comes back to that thing about being useful. You know, how, how, how is the permaculture movement useful? If the permaculture movement is seen as a load of people sort of uh, who have the privilege of having access to land, making nice gardens for themselves, you know, then I'm not sure it really is, go is going to, to do it. You know, whereas some of the urban, urban, gardening projects that I've seen like in France for example in really gritty kind of parts of the city where they're not just about permaculture they're also about creating spaces for people to come together their education spaces their spaces of resistance their spaces of uh, all sorts of different stuff you know maybe that's it but I, but I, it it's um yeah be useful I thought that was just the best advice I've heard be useful do something useful you know don't don't be a passenger and uh, um, uh, yeah, I th and, and, and I think some of the as people will hear if you listen to those, those two podcasts, you know, it's people are saying there is a the movement of movements has has grown hugely in the last in the last few years, and the links across between uh, a whole range of different movements are really built and strengthened, and that's really great. And we need to keep putting a lot of time and effort. Uh, into that but I do think a lot of people are going to be asking the question after COP you know what happens after COP what, what does our activism look like after COP and you know on the big Extinction Rebellion protest the other day I think there was a lot of conversation about you know this thing of making crazy objects and blocking streets and gluing ourselves to stuff and making a lot of noise they've rumbled that now they figured out how to police that now you know, like the, the, it was in, the, the number of police and the tactics were just insane the other day for what was a massively fluffy kind of a protest, a bit naughty, a bit playful, a bit disruptive, but, you know, not like sort of some fascist march or something. And they've just so so what comes next, I think, is a really big conversation among everybody. You know, what does activism look like? that holds people to account? And, and I think a big part of that is going to be about um, uh, making life much more difficult for the people in the oil and gas companies who are responsible for this <laughs> because you know that because the the idea because actually i'll just say one more thing which which really shocked me actually and i kind of knew about it but i went to a talk about it and and i was like this is just extraordinary is these a lot of international trade agreements now have these secret courts designed into them whereby corporations can sue national governments in secret courts that are not open to the public, uh, where they are tried by, by uh, lawyers and the decisions are internationally binding. And it means that basically coal companies and oil and gas companies can sue national governments for their climate change policies. So for example, the German 
the Dutch government is being sued by two uh, German coal companies for closing down coal-fired power stations as part of their climate things. The Italian government is being sued by a British oil uh, exploration company called Rockhopper, who wanted to drill for oil in the Adriatic Sea. Uh, and they can sue them for like billions of dollars for basically stopping them doing what they want to do. So, so there's a fundamentally uh, hugely anti-democratic uh, aspect to this. And the idea that actually there are these laws in place that are making governments more cautious than they would otherwise be, because if they feel if they move too fast, they're going to get sued by all these companies. So I think one of the things we have to do is to bring an enormous amount of pressure to get those laws changed because they are they're psychopathic. <laughs> but also, you know, of, making yeah. this making this kind of stuff visible. You know, if it's if it's behind yeah. closed doors and no one knows about it, you know about it because you went to a talk at COP. But it's not something I would hear here in Australia in the local news, for example. So you know, no. making it visible, telling that story, telling the story of where the where those things are going wrong, at the same time as sharing the stories about the things that are juicy and delicious, as you said. And so speaking up, yeah. I think, is a really huge thing that we can do. You know, like you've got podcast and writing and, you know, it's there's so many different forms of activism and I think, you know, there's different, different forms but really um, constantly being, you know, in the space where you're um, opening conversations, um, speaking up, sharing stories, good and bad, I think is, is feels to me as something that's just absolutely critical. Yeah. Absolutely. Someone I've been spending a lot of time with over the course of the last couple of years is Nora Bateson. Nora is a profoundly creative, original and inspirational systems thinker and the creator of Warm Data and People Need People programs. We've yet to record our podcast too, but I wanted to include Nora here as part of our conversation about where to in 2022. And also, this is an invitation for you to join me in warm data conversation. So watch out for the invitations for that. There's something that Nora has said that has stuck in my mind so much. As a lifelong activist, I thought I was focusing on doing and being the change. But she brought to attention what I've actually been doing, which is creating the conditions for change to take place. She talks about this in the way that Perception is action. Changing our perception is the action that really matters. She talks about too that there being a difference between creating the conditions that shift this perception and making the rules. So instead of trying to force something to happen by setting a set of rules to say this is how it should be, it's about bringing people together in relationship so that your story changes my story through my perception, through your eyes, or through the multiple contexts that we see when we come together. That changes how we think about things. And once we've changed how we think about things, change naturally happens. And Nora suggests that the most important task of this moment is to generate a base of people who are eager to practice perceiving the complexity and interdependency in every aspect of our lives. And this is the invitation into coming together in warm data conversations around the world, in multi-generational, in cross-contextual conversations, so that we can practice perceiving the complexity and the interdependency in our lives. Nora always uses natural metaphors to explain what she's trying to communicate. And one of those being, think like a mushroom. Be the communication through which organisms nurture each other. And one other thing that I wanted to share with you about Nora's work is that she's a deeply caring and compassionate person. And she's found over the years that she's often that caring nature has often been mistaken for weakness and in a recent tweet she said do not mistake my care for weakness and I also feel that this is an incredibly powerful link both to the work often that women are doing but also to the work of permaculture which is deeply embedded in the ethic of care earth care people care and fair share I more recently came to know of the work of Jeremy Lent a scholar, activist, philosopher, author, educator, described by George Monbiot as one of the greatest thinkers of our time. 
He's the author of Web of Meaning and The Patterning Instinct. And he's also a host of a new meta network towards describing what an ecological civilization might be. And this meta network is called Deep Transformation. And together with Jeremy, I'm one of the moderators of this program. And Jeremy declares that our mainstream world has expired, but takes a step forward to engage us in the conversation about imagining and defining and describing what will replace it. So in this conversation here with Jeremy, I ask him what it is that he feels we need to pay our attention to and what are some of the steps forward when, with this understanding that we can take. I also really loved one of the ways that he describes in his book how change is happening. And so I ask him about that too. That it's this recognition of this kind of fractal place in which we live that we don't need to look elsewhere for greater meaning or um, to, for something bigger than ourselves. We realize that what ourselves really are is something so massive and amazing to begin with. We just need to recognize that. And I love, too, the way that Nora Bateson talks about it, you know, is that it's life, lifing. We're lifing. Right, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and so coming to the, coming to the a thread of looking at, well, what do we do with this understanding? Mm. How does this then guide us in where we need to sort of be paying our attention to, how we can help to possibly shift the flow because we are, this juggernaut is, is still happening. One of the things I heard you say or read in your book was talking about how the weave is loosening, yeah. which gives the chance for the possibilities of new threads to be woven in there. And I, and I, it sort of makes me realise, again, that it's not just, well, there's this and there's that, there's this dichotomy that is sort of we just slice it in half and we kind of abandon that and we're on this. There is actually a reweaving that happens and that some of this will continue and it's not, you know, it's not the good, bad, it's not that dichotomy. And I think that is really important to keep in mind because sometimes um, I feel a sense that there's a holding on because thinking, well, I don't want to let go of the old because there's some things about that that I like. And, that's right. And I think it's, uh, I wonder whether you can just talk a little bit about Yeah, that. I think that's very true. Um, and, you know, when we look at our civilization, um, it, it's it's becoming increasingly clear what some of the terrible things are that um, the civilization is doing to the living earth and to other people within it. It's uh, all these incredible divisions. But it's absolutely, we've actually, there's so much to be grateful for in what our civilization has produced. And while, um, you know, I we started talking right from the outset, I've been talking about how there is something so fundamentally wrong with this dominant worldview, how we need to shift to this other worldview of interconnectedness. We also need to recognize this, this dominant worldview brought incredible, wonderful benefits to so many human beings around. It's like whether it's um, understanding the germ theory of disease and recognizing how we can actually, um, how things like hygiene can help, whether it's this incredible technology that allows me to talk to you right now, we're on other sides of the world and yet we can connect and other people can then connect with what we're saying. Something, these things are wonderful. And when we look at where we're headed for, which is accelerating at a faster and faster rate towards a precipice, it looks like we may be looking at something that could cause a collapse of the civilization. And I don't view the idea of a collapse of this civilization in any which way as a positive thing. In fact, it would be the greatest disaster to ever happen to humans on, ever since we evolved on this planet. And the, the, it's like something to be avoided at all costs. And so then we lead to this question, well, how do we change it if we need to transform it at this deep layer, um, but we can't let it collapse? How, do, how does that change happen? And that comes to this notion of this reweaving. And I like to think of, you know, that, that simple kids game called Cat's Cradle, where you, you sort of, you have the string and you, you have it in a certain pattern on your fingers, and then you set it up so much in the, just the right way that you, you do one change and the pattern is completely different. And so it's a kind of a cool, cool game to play. Well, basically, we need to perform that cat's cradle on our civilization. What that basically means is that while this civilization 
is kind of unraveling. That weave is is getting looser. All these um, <clears throat> these incredible ways in which it doesn't make sense is be beginning to show itself. We need to take that weave and then reweave things that are life affirming within the middle of a civilization that itself is leading to actually a negation of life. Yeah. So we have to do that. You know, it's really like that, those, that notion of Buckminster Fuller <clears throat> used to talk about the way we um, need to change the, what we don't, the system we don't like is not to attack the system, but to build a different system that's so much better that, other, that, that everything gets drawn to it. Similarly, we need to basically do just like you're doing with permaculture in every aspect of our civilization, build what is better within it. Mm -hmm. So that when finally this civilization does kind of unravel to the point that it no longer works, it no longer makes sense, it's going to be more like shedding a skin. So it'll be as if people then can then look back and say, oh, I get, when when did it when did it happen that that old civilization was no more and this other civilization actually started to become the one that was dominant and it so it becomes something that it, it's like a phase transition in a system but we need to do it in such a way that the phase transition is not like an avalanche not like this total destruction like a house of cards collapsing but actually the system itself the energy that people get drawn to becomes that more life affirming system rather than the one that is degenerating. Mm, yeah, I really love that because, as you say, the the concept of collapse. I, I can't even begin to imagine, you know, where you, where you could go from there. And yeah. so my energy mm. and all that I do is about the just what you just described of, of trying to create uh possibilities for connecting with a different way and something that's really tangible and something that's very shareable and something yeah. that's very attractive as well and i and i totally agree with you on that idea that it needs to be something that draws people in rather than pushes people away i remember being but i also see that there there is the role as you mentioned earlier too for for the fighting, for the saying no. Yes. And I was talking to Satish Kumar the other day and he said that we need to, we need to be saying no to this. We need to be saying yes to this, creating something new and and also connecting as much as we can. And so these different yes. faces of this transition, I think all need to be, to be nourished and connected and valued um, rather than what we're sometimes seeing is like, well, what you're doing is not the right way or what you're doing is not the yeah. right way, or I've got a better way of going forward, but actually seeing that all these different dimensions of transformation are part of the whole. And so yeah. the way of doing that, connecting, is that what you're saying? You know, keep yeah. connecting. I think, I think that's right. And, and it's a very important <clears throat> uh, distinction you're bringing into the conversation that um, we can't only just focus our attention on what's positive and, think that by ignoring the bad that's going on, it'll just kind of go away or it'll, we actually have to resist it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's where this concept of revolutionary love comes in that you were mentioning earlier. That's actually a phrase <clears throat> that is the title of a book by a radical activist rabbi who actually lives here in Berkeley, California, called, called Rabbi Michael Lerner, Br brilliant <clears throat> um, person who's been campaigning for decades. Um, and the notion of revolutionary love is to recognize that we do have to fight against the stuff that is wrong. We have to demonstrate and do everything to resist the, the coal mines that are taking, that are getting like doubling down in, in Australia, as well as um, you know, the polar, political polarization that's taking place. And we have to not just turn away from that, but resist that. But here's the key thing. We have to resist it without turning the people who are doing that stuff that is destructive, without othering them, without seeing them as the enemy, without, seeing, without um, making them like lesser than what we are. But actually, and that's what revolutionary love is, to recognize that each of those people who are causing the harm, actually they themselves also were once infants who just wanted warmth and love and, and belonging. And they didn't get that. And instead they got harshness. And as they grew up, 
they got told by their patriarchal culture and their and everything around them that they had to basically um, just shove down any feel all of those feelings they had and become hard and then turn their hatred that became hatred of self into other and hate others and all that stuff. But they are deeply suffering within themselves as they're doing that. And that doesn't mean that we should allow them to get away with what they're doing. We have to, we have to like push back hard against the results of their actions, but we have to do it recognizing that they are sharing our planet with us, that they want to also love, they want to feel good about themselves. And it's only when there's enough connections like that that take place that we can actually transform to this kind of symbiocene, to this ecological civilization. Because as long as you know we're the good guys and they're the bad guys, we'll be stuck in the very the very worldview of separation that's caused these problems in the first place. So even if we think we win a few, few victories here or there, that's actually going to be like a pyrrhic victory because we need to deeply connect with people until they themselves start to dissolve the barriers within themselves and start to feel more connected. Mm, absolutely. So what's next for you, Jeremy? What are you working on this year? And yeah. I heard you say you're writing another book, which is very exciting. And um, you also have other things happening, I understand. Yeah, yeah, that, um, that's right. And it all has to do with these <clears throat> very themes that we've been talking about in this conversation. So, um, well, first off, just in terms of this next book that I'm very excited to be sort of now turning my attention to, um, well, the working title of that is, is actually going to be um, future flourishing pathways toward an ecological civilization. And we can just think of an ecological civilization as basically being uh, a civilization that actually is built on this life affirming foundation rather than this extraction and exploitation, wealth accumulation foundation of our current civilization. And, it, and, and really the idea behind this book is to show how it's actually being done right now in all these different parts of the world people such as yourself and the, and the people that you're training in their permaculture and in so many different fields are actually planting the seeds, actually, tra or, or if you take the notion of pathways, actually laying the groundwork towards that ecological civilization. So my book is really more than anything just to flesh out what is actually being done and put it all together so we can realize there is this vision we can move towards rather than just moving into some sort of haze and not knowing where it's at. And uh, what I get excited about right now in the short term is that um, everything we've been talking about, it has been in terms of this notion of networking, that it's not like what one of us is doing, but what each of us is doing only gets to be effective when it's part of what others are doing. And as I was um, giving these uh, courses I gave online last year about these themes of the web of meaning or about ecological civilization, the primary response I was getting from people is they get inspired and want to connect, um, but wanted some sort of platform to stay connected with around the world, to share these ideas with others and not lose them. Because so many people get this notion of what's necessary, but then they're, they're in a worldview and in a community and with other people who don't get it. And then you feel like, well, am I kind of missing something? Or, you know, it's very easy to get isolated and lose the energy. So this um, new initiative I'm working on right now is to set up a network. It's going to be called the Deep Transformation Network, an online network where people can actually come from around the world, uh, change makers or just thoughtful people or people who are curious or just want to be connected and actually find a nurturing community to share their ideas, to like nurture each other, to share about uh, what they're what they're doing and um, what's taking place to share visions of like this notion of future flourishing to get engaged in you know, deeper conversations about um, how should economics look like or how can we transform technology and basically build this global network where we actually feel we are part of this connective tissue this mycelial network that could lead to this transformation. Mm. Fantastic. I look forward to being part of that. I'm very excited about that, Jeremy, because it is, it's like you're saying, we, it is a global network and the more that we, we do connect and have these conversations, it feels stronger. And there's something yeah. about what's happened since everyone's been in lockdown 
that more of this type of conversation has been happening, more connections happening online. And while there's been so much suffering, there feels like there's been also a level of opening for a deepening of conversations beyond within communities, but beyond communities as well. I think that that is very true, Marag. I think in a sense, it's been this terrible trauma of loss of our physical shared community with others like friends and, and, and people around and family. And, and yet what has happened is the kind of seeds of this notion of our human superorganism, the sense of a planetary consciousness has expanded massively as people have gotten, they've had no choice but to get used to these kind of Zoom calls or whatever, or just uh, realizing we are part of something bigger. And you know, hopefully before too long, it's hard to see where the light is at the end of the tunnel, but you know, we know this will eventually uh, go back into where we can connect with each other and more in more kind of intimate physical ways again. But maybe we've expanded that, that sense of planetary consciousness to a level that would not have happened without this forcing it to the point where we can, that can actually be part of what unfolds in the future in a mm-hmm. very powerful way. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining me today on the show, Jeremy. It's been just wonderful to take this time to to communicate with you about ideas that have been, you know, I've spent my lifetime thinking about, and um, it's just wonderful to connect with you. Yeah, well, th- thank you, Marag, and thank you so much for all that you're doing. And it's just been a great pleasure talking with you and uh, asking the, the deep questions and being able to explore them together. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. And now to the voice of Helena Norberg Hodge from Local Futures. In my early 20s, I met Helena at Schumacher College where she was teaching. And then I traveled to volunteer with her in the Himalayan region of Ladakh. Both of those experiences in conversation with and working with Helena have transformed my life. Over the decades since we first met, we've stayed in touch. And just recently, we recorded a four-part series. Uh, So this is about to be released, and it's on big picture activism. So here's a snippet from the conversation with Helena Norberg-Hodge. Well, thank you for joining me again, Helena. It's been wonderful having these conversations with you over the last few weeks. We started with that, the big picture thinking, looking at um, economics, we then um, flowed into exploring uh, food systems change and then into looking at community, the importance of community. And so today, what I really would like to focus on um, exploring is with all of that and thinking about the kind of change we need, what are the sorts of education, action and, and leadership we need to help bring that forward? So. Um, thank you for being here again. Well, I'm very happy to be here and so glad that you're doing this work, which I think of as big picture activism. So I do think there's a huge need for education, meaning sharing both examples and information, but also sharing a framing, a bigger picture of what's going on. And because for us, this is absolutely vital. We believe that most of our crises are connected to this dominant economic system. And even if people don't believe that that's the case, what I think they will be seeing is that whether their concern is the health of their children or what's happening to their school or whether they're concerned about climate change or poverty in the third world, whatever their concern and whatever the multiple issues are that we're facing, money to deal with them is just disappearing up there in that sort of ozone cloud where fewer and fewer people make more and more money and in an obscene way. And even in my native part of the world, Scandinavia. And so we addressed that at the beginning, but I think now coming back to looking at what we can do and activism, I just want to really remind people that it's actually an opportunity, looking at the bigger picture is an opportunity to help people come together in a really united voice. 
doesn't mean that we all become part of the same organization, doesn't mean that we abandon our particular concern. But if we could just take a little bit of time, step back a bit to think about the problems we face. And what we're saying is if you take the time to go deep enough and broad enough, you will see that these crises are connected. So this bigger picture needs to be shared and it needs to get out there, you know, just like you're doing now, you know, in promoting permaculture, but with this bigger picture that shows how important permaculture is and how it can answer so many of our needs and solve so many of our problems. Well, it turns out that we've been essentially manipulated in a way into a framing where we've been told for these last 35 years that we are going to solve these problems as individuals. Mm -hmm. So we should just focus on recycling our plastic a bit better, driving our car less, not buying so much stuff. We need to deal with our greed and our personal addiction And now we're being told that we also have to deal with humanity's resistance to handling information. We're being told that people don't want information, they don't need information, we shouldn't be talking anymore. Just let's get on with the action. And the action that's being encouraged is this very narrow, small steps that individual consumers can engage in. Now, what we're saying is when we look at the bigger picture is that no, please do what you can to come together in a community group, make it, you know, between, you know, even two to 20 people, and then examine this bigger picture and figure out what you might be able to do jointly. And I think I talked earlier about how important it also is as part of that group to really embark on a deeper psychological healing, which has to do with deeper connection to one another. But at the same time, as you examine these issues from a deeper uh, level, it will become so apparent that we have been, you know, prevented from seeing that community initiative, where we change the I to a we, can suddenly bring in this multiplier effect and be so empowering. And we can know that what we're doing is so real and so, um, yeah, has these multiple benefits. And so this is the whole field of localization. But again, when you understand the global bigger picture, you will see that what happens to food and farming, what happens to farmers is really what happens to our health, to our bodies, and to the planet. And so focusing on that and taking any number of community initiatives from edible school gardens to community gardens to food co-ops, and it doesn't always have to be a co-op. You can link up with um, private shops even and get them to carry products from local growers. Now, all the time, as we do these things, we also need to be aware that part of the information and the education we need to spread is that we are all acting inside a system that makes human labor, human care, human intelligence too expensive. So we're all running faster and faster and we're also short of time, which is one of the biggest costs of the dominant system, the time pressures. So we need to be very kind to ourselves, to others, to everybody, basically. I do recall you talking about the internet, gosh, 25, 30 years ago, and I remember hearing you, and I, and now here we sit talking across the internet and trying to find ways to utilise it to amplify this perspective. So, you know, we can't, you know, I get stuck in the point where thinking, well, I can't not use it yeah. because otherwise I won't be able to, to reach out. So how do you feel about that? You see, this is where distinguishing between your individual choices and your ability as an individual to 
be the change. You can't be a healthy society. You can't be a community. You can't be the, you know, the, the thriving health that we're talking about, a healthy society and a healthy ecosystem. There's no way that you as an individual are going to be that change. That change has to come about through collective action. And so now what can we do as activists? We'd be silly, I believe, to say, well, we're not going to use it. And I'm never going to drive my car. And yet I am motivated to try to bring change in the world. Mm-hmm. No, we have to be willing to distinguish and be willing to compromise and to talk about it, you know, to show this is in no way hypocritical. We should not only be setting up those local um, systems, which cannot be perfect under the current mm-hmm. climate, but that can do a lot particularly in the area of local food and and real human connection. So I would say for anybody thinking about their children's future, for sure investing in community and land and the skills um, that are needed is essentially important. And I want to circle back to Joe Brewer for a moment now because Joe uh, focuses on creating culture labs, looking at different ways that we can be living And I I wanted to ask him particularly about how young people can find their way forward when access to land and resources is becoming more and more challenging. I want to ask you then, because here in Australia and and perhaps where you are too, so many young people are almost desperate to try and find a way that they can begin. They finish school, they're going, well, I can't afford to buy land anywhere. I can't afford to build a house. There's so much disruption, I can't even get a a job. So a complete rethink about money and work and housing and ways of living feels so imminent. And I wonder what advice would you give to young people? You know, like I'm talking 17, 18 year olds who are just stepping into the world going, what next? What now? Where do I go from here? I would want to give advice to them. And at the same time, or maybe like a few minutes later, (laughs) give advice to the baby boomers because it's their relationship between the boomers and these young people is what really matters. So I'll tell you a story really quickly and then I'll answer the question for the young people. So young people, if you're listening, get ready. I have a baby boomer friend, meaning he's 63 years old. He lives in California. And he has enough money and savings that he was starting to play with cryptocurrency and has a little more money now. So what did he do? He gifted it to me. We're in the process of getting it moved. It's it's worth about 120,000 US dollars right now. So that we can decolonize a piece of land and create a community commons where we're going to create the Bari Chara Ecoversity. Now, why does that matter to young people? Because if we have land that is held in common and the land's purpose is community, as a community mission, and it's already paid for without debt, meaning we just had the money to buy it outright, then we don't have to make any money on that land. So as a young person, if you align with the mission of the work that we're doing on that land, we could invite you to live there. And if we have a relationship with local farmers before we've built our own food forests and organic gardens, then we'll feed you. Because we're also gonna teach you things that you can go and practice on the land of those campesino farmers in exchange for food. Or we teach their kids alongside the kids from the outside and they don't pay for it because they're donating food. All the while, we're starting to do permaculture work and building food sovereignty for the people living on the land. And there's a transition period where there's gonna need to be some money. We'll have to build some buildings. We'll have to pay for some things for a little while until it's self-sufficient. But that's just like you were inside your mother's uterus for nine months before you were born because you developed within the safety of a nurturing environment. So we only need finance to create the nurturing environment until it's able to work on its own. And after we've done that, we have a community learning center that is also, in this case, a nine and a half hectare piece of land 
connected to another 20 hectares of land adjacent to it for friends projects where everyone's trying to do reforestation work. So automatically we have 30 hectares of land. That's a lot of land to work on for a bunch of young people who would do work in exchange for food and learning and community. So just come, don't pay me any money. I don't need it. Don't worry about getting a certificate. It's not gonna matter. Your reputation and the referral from people who know your work is all that's gonna matter. Come live here, don't pay a cent, get your education for free and start doing regenerative work right now because there's no time to waste. And this is the model for what permaculture centers need to become for the next phase, for the next 30 years. Really the next 10 years is urgent that those who have the money to buy land, decolonize the land, turn it into a community commons, recruit the people who will build the education centers and do the regenerative work, and then tell the young people to show up. Buy a couple of tents, build a simple lean-to roof, get those kids out of the rain, start building wa rainwater harvesting systems and just get to work. And so what I see for young people is a lot of them have been told the great lie, which is that if you work hard, get good grades, you'll get a good job. You'll make a lot of money and you'll be good. You'll be successful. The great lie is that there's this huge cancer, just wealth hoarding, where a tiny number of people now own almost everything and the whole system's collapsing. And by the way, the biosphere is collapsing too. And if you wanna do something about that, you're not gonna do it by making money. You're not gonna do it by pursuing money. You're gonna do it by living in relationship to community and to land, which you're gonna discover are the same thing. But you're only gonna discover that if the land is held in common. And so I see this is really essential that we need pockets, little important places where people can just come and learn and do work exchange while learning how to create value for the community. And as they create value for the community, an alternative economy will arise. And those who have money need to create a buffer of financial freedom for the period of time that it takes to get there. I feel like the kinds of things that you're saying now are the things that so many millions and millions and millions of young people really need to hear right now. I agree. And uh, because we're, what's happening now, I feel, is this sense of what, what you talked about, you know, this, this despair and the despair that I felt as well as a young person. But the possibilities of it, of it shifting into something that is deeply regenerative personally and culturally and ecologically, it's totally possible. It's absolutely. We're doing it. We are, we are doing it. <laughs> are. It's like, I'm not just talking about, we're doing it. I, no, that's right. I don't know if you can see the dirt on my finger. Like we're doing it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's real. It's real. <laughs> right. And, you know, like, I mean, I think this is the thing. Sometimes often, you know, when you're in it so much that you, you, you're kind of looking out but actually noticing, noticing how much is here now. I mean, that story itself, to tell the story about it is here, it is now, it is happening. Look where it's happening. Look how it's myceliating. Looking, you know, there's this, under, this deep understanding that it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. But the, the kind of the dominant narrative that we hear doesn't point to those things, doesn't help us notice those things. And so I absolutely agree that the act of, slowing down and noticing different things, the things that we need to be noticing, the things that nourish us and nourish our relationships is it's a very simple and profound message that can open up our hearts and minds to, to know a completely other way of being that holds possibility and, and a sense of hope. Yeah, my hope is that there's a growing number of older people who will support this transition for the younger people 
and there's a growing number of younger people who are rescuing themselves and rescuing each other into these solutions, into these places. Because I have the experience just in the last few days of coming into contact with three different people who are suicidal, uh, just because the world is so crazy and difficult and it's only gonna get worse. So what we absolutely need, knowing that the world is gonna get worse in that way for a, for a while, for a while still, it's gonna get worse. And those of us who are going to carry through for what comes after, we need to know how to be nurtured and healthy and well and happy and capable so that we're good for each other and good for ourselves. And this can happen even as the dark side continues, the, the negative and painful side continues, the burgeoning of this new way, the new indigenous human, the new indigenous human that brings rivers back to life, that restores native biodiversity, that recovers cultural history, and that plants the seeds for the trees that our granddaughters will sit under. And it's our granddaughters that we care about because they're the ones who may or may not have children. And if humans are gonna continue, it's because there are mothers in the future. Mm. So this is really, really important. And I say this as a man who has a daughter that I'm able to support the cultivation of a future female leader as a father. And so this relationship to our daughters and granddaughters is gonna be beautifully, painfully important. And where are they going to go to learn how to connect to nature? It's in these community places. So they need to be created. There already are some. I'd say there are already maybe a few tens of thousands in the world. It sounds like a big number and it's also small, but we need millions. Mm -hmm. We need millions by next year or the year after. Because it's down to crunch time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joy. No, thank you for having me. Always lovely to talk with you, Marek. Another person who's thinking at this scale is John Delu, the founder of Ecosystems Restoration Camps a global grassroots movement of people working to repair broken ecosystems together. The goal of the Ecosystems Restoration Camps program is to reach over a million people, millions of people around the world through a gift economy to be able to restore degraded ecosystems, to restore biodiversity, and to, in that process, be improving local livelihoods. And what in our conversation, he was saying the other day, uh, in preparation for a podcast that's coming, so watch out for that one, uh, is that ecosystems restoration obviously cannot be done alone. This is big picture work. This is planetary work. We need to work at ecosystems level and then a planetary level together. And in order to do this, he's saying essentially what many others have been saying throughout this series is Let's work together. This is a movement of movements. To make this change happen, it's going to take all of us. And so he left me with, with this thought the other day about let's work together for the rest of our lives. And I think this is such, such uh, important words to carry with us as we're thinking about any of the kind of work that we're doing, about how we can be doing it with others. So shifting from that I to the we. There's a bit of a youth thread going on here in the where to in 2022 because it comes up in my mind a lot thinking about the future and thinking about where young people are taking this and how as I'm moving into more of a role of an elder I can support younger people. One of the people I'd, I'd love to share a small snippet of conversation with you here now is Fritjof Capra. Fritjof Capra is one of the leading ecological thinkers of our time. Uh, I have the great honor of, of having met him when I was in my early 20s. I studied with him at Schumacher College. And we also have stayed in touch over these decades. And I now work with him in his Systems View of Life course, mentoring young people. We have a group of young people going through his course each time and he comes and together we mentor these uh, teenagers. 
I'm sharing you this clip because in it he talks about his desire to have greater con connectivity intergenerationally so that the elders of the movement of these ecological thinkers um, have greater communication with young people. The work of the young activists is entirely in line with the most advanced thinking in science. And so our task together is to see where we can make these bridges. And I would love to be in conversation with anyone who'd like to join me in that. You know, to talk a little bit more about these youth movements, we, we have several youth movements now who are very strong in the United States. We have the Sunrise Movement, which uh, just a few years ago was just a bunch of kids, you know? And now they have representatives in Washington. They talk to the media. They are a strong political voice in the country. We have in the UK, we have the Extinction Rebellion. And then we have this little girl, you know, who is no longer a little girl, Greta Thunberg, who is now 18 and sparked a worldwide movement, you know, Fridays mm -hmm. for Future. So we have these youth movements and um, let me tell you what my concern is. My concern is that uh, I know that the values and ideas of these youth, youth movements are completely consistent with the kind of systemic thinking that I've spent most of my professional life developing and teaching. And uh, so I would love to be able to establish a bridge between the community of elders to which I belong, who have spent the last 40 years developing a conceptual framework for a new worldview and a new value system, and the energy and passion of the youth who are very successful in, in making their voices heard. Now, I, I, in previous years, you know, I took part in anti-nuclear marches. I went to, I actually went to Occupy meetings. Uh, my daughter was active in the Occupy movement, leading these, these circles or groups or whatever they were called. I went to Bernie Sanders uh, uh, rallies and so on. But, you know, as I'm getting older, I'm not going to continue to go out in the street and protest. But I can make a valuable contribution by showing the young people that their values and their ideas are totally consistent with some of the most advanced thinking in science. And so I would love to be able to, to make this bridge, you know. And uh, in, in the online course I teach, the CAPRA course, I have plenty of room for young people, not only your uh, PERMA youth group, but if, if somebody from the Sunrise Movement comes and says, we have five young leaders who would love to learn about systemic thinking, you know, they can take my course. You know, I would be very glad to offer them scholarships. I'm so excited to hear that. And one of the things that we're trying to do with Perma Youth too is to connect with Sunrise, with Exile, with all of the yeah. different youth movements. And there's an organisation called Climate 2025 who I'm working with to try and see if we can bring together these different groups in a way that this conversation can happen. And I would love to, you know, help in any way to, to host that bridging uh, that's extremely exciting because, like you're yeah. saying, understanding that depth of, yeah. of science and thinking that where they're standing now, they, they're not alone. Their, think, their thinking and their action is based on this huge wealth of knowledge and experience and that they're supported. I think that would be so powerful. And the final voice in this session is from Satish Kumar again. He offers his three key actions of what he feels we need to be doing to bring about the change we need to see in the world. So what can we do? We have to build the grassroots movement. When big grassroots movement will bring pressure on the governments and on the business, they will change. So we need to do uh, three things. Number one, 
protest, like the young people marching um, uh, on Fridays, Fridays for the future, like Extinction Rebellion, many, many movements like that. This is a very important part of the uh, new grassroots movement. We need to protest against what is wrong, how we are destroying our planet Earth. We have to raise our voice, speak truth to power. That is important. We should not be fearful. We should, be put, our, we should put our lives online and say we cannot accept this kind of destruction of our natural world. We cannot accept this destruction of our, our uh, forest and our, our environment and our ecosystem. But that is not enough. Protesting is too negative if we stick only with protest. Protest should be complemented with protecting. There are many, many good things in our society. The indigenous wisdom, the culture, the arts, the crafts, the music, the communities, the small farms, small business. So all these small things, which are beautiful things, we have learned from our ancestors for hundreds of years, and that tradition must be protected. So the protest movement should also be a protection movement, conserve and protect what is already good. At the moment, the human footprint is so large. We are in Anthropocene. If you put all the human numbers of 8 billion people on this planet Earth and all our cities and the roads and, and airports and the seaports and, and the kind of uh, motorways and the railways, um, infrastructure is so big. And then add to that all the animals which humans use, dogs, cats, horses, pigs, chickens, cows, all those 70 to 80 percent of our planet is occupied by just human species and their animals. And only 15 or 20 percent of the land is left wild. And that is the reason that we are facing pandemic. This COVID crisis, the result of our encroachment and impingement of the wildlife. And we are destroying the wild. And so we have to leave a lot of wild intact so that Wildlife does not get into food chain. So that is uh, protection. Protecting is a very important part of our movement. But that is also not enough. The third aspect is to build, create alternatives, like we have created Shumaka College, like Vandana Shiva has created Bija Vidya Peet, the Earth University, like you are creating this permaculture um, institute to teach permaculture. We have to create new uh, new ways of living, alternative ways of living, which are sustainable, which are regenerative, which are imaginative, which are creative, which are fulfilling, which are rewarding, which is joyful. So we have to create. So protect, pro no, no, sorry, protest, protect, and build. These are the three things as a movement we should do. And we should do it all with love, without anger without fear, without anxiety. Do it out of love. We do it because we love Earth. We love nature. We love people. We love our future generations. We love beauty. We love all these good qualities of life. And so our actions should be inspired and driven by love and not by anger, not by fear, not by anxiety. We should do it with joy working for the environmental movement and ecology movement and sustainability movement and permaculture, permaculture movement should be a source of joy and a pleasure and not anxiety. So this, all these things should be done with love. So these are the three things we should do. Protest, protect and build and do it with love. So thank you all for being here. It's been a great delight to have your company. I hope you enjoyed this curation of conversations about where to in 2022. I'd love it if you'd share maybe an insight or your favorite quote from this session in the chat. And I'd also like to invite you to stay in touch and join future live sessions, maybe a film club or a pollination session. The best way to do that is to stay in touch by my newsletter. So if you see something come through, make sure you open it up. Or better still, become part of our global learning community. And I know many of you here tonight, um, many of you who are part of this session are already there. So a big shout out to you all. And finally, thank you to all those people who are so gracious 
to join me in conversation regularly in these podcasts. So the podcast, again, you can find at Sense Making in a Changing World. I'll put the link in the chat. Feel free to stay around now. I know we've gone a bit over time today. Thank you for sticking around and being here. Um, I am going to stay online for a bit longer now too, if you'd like to continue to chat. Um, So thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure to have your company. See you next time.